Hi, everybody. Welcome to Habitual Excellence presented by Value Capture. I'm Mark Graven. And today we are joined by Jose Bustillo. He is a client advisor with Value Capture. Jose, how are you? Very good, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to have you here. And we're going to hear you know, some of your background and in manufacturing and then talk about the transition and application into healthcare. Um, so I'm excited to hear about all that. If you could start off, you know, it's always interesting, I think, to hear how did you get introduced to Lean or the Toyota production system or however it was being framed when you got started here? Very good, Mark. Thank you for having me. Um, you know what? I uh, When I was uh, finishing college, I had the opportunity to work uh, inside a Ford Motor Company here in my hometown in Hermosillo, in Mexico. And interesting enough, um, Ford back then had a, a, a joint venture with Mazda. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that, uh, uh, like in 1970s, Mazda were broke. And uh, what happened is that uh, Toyota adopted um, Ma Mazda to help them and to go through the, the, the problems they, they were going through. Anyway, long story short, what happened is that when Ford decided to create this facility in my hometown, basically they partnered with Mazda to, you know, design the facility and design the the social technical system to be more specific. And uh, so I was uh, I was able to work there for a couple of years from 1987 through 89, and I was able to see and live in that in that environment where. You were able to see the a paced uh, production where you have people working on teams, people working with vision management, uh, you know, pull, uh, pull systems, but also, you know, the Jidoka concept in action where they were in reality developing people to uh, solve problems and they were demanded, not expected, but demanded to pull the core whenever safety or quality was endangered. So it was so cool to see the response from the teams, the team leaders, from the group leaders, the managers, and so forth. Uh, it, was, it was so nice to learn from that environment. So that's, that's, that's kind of the, the, the beginning of my career, learning to see that. And then later um, uh, worked for the auto supplier, where initially we, we hired um, um, Kaizen Institute, um, Masaki Mai, and um, a specific uh, sensei that I learned so much from him, uh, Clyde Hogan, which was one of my mentors. So, Can, can you talk a little bit more? Um, you know, some listeners might not really know uh, the term judoka. Can you, can you explain that a little bit more and, 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 and the Andon chord and, and what some of the basis and of, of that was? Yes. So this uh, Jidoka concept comes from uh, designing, designing the process. Uh, it can be a machine, it can be uh, people doing work, but designing the process to see uh, when and where problems are happening. Ideally, you know, you want maybe the process to show you that or to stop if you are having a problem but at a minimum, people in the process should be able to see that there is a problem. It can be a risk for safety, as an example, or it can be a risk for uh, quality. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that uh, you want the process or the people to be able to stop. Um, and, and then and the thing is that and that triggers um, a, pr a problem-solving activity that uh, can be hopefully initiated by the doer in that moment, um, or if not uh, possible, then a uh, request uh, for help through the help chain. Uh, usually, again, you can use different tools to pull for help. It can be uh, a signal, can be a, a flag, can be um, um, you know a light out there. Uh, but there's a structure behind that. Uh, a group of people that uh, they know that they will respond to the pool and they know what to do, which is trying to go there, swarm, and trying to solve problem to root as soon as possible. But if not possible, then at a minimum, 
uh, isolate from risk and from there maybe schedule the problem solving activity in a in a break or something like that. So Jidoka is so critical and sometimes it's confused because people translate literally the words into from Japanese into English. But in reality, it's more than, uh, you know, creating some um, automation to the process. It, it is more than that is exposing problems and then having, um, you know, a structure people responding to the problem in real time that's that's kind of the a key concept yeah yeah and you know it seems like this practice of or this expectation of exposing problems requires a certain culture to make that yes. safe and i was wondering yes. if you could talk about yeah i mean what, what would you have to say about that what needs to be done to make it safe oh perfect thank you for that you know the Back then, some of the, the 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 principles, if you will, or values that um, practiced there and respected. Uh, yes, teamwork, continuous improvement. Okay, we team, we need to continuously uh, improve because we're not perfect. We have a lot of problems, but uh, here four specific guiding principles that uh, I was able to. Uh, learn through not just the words but also from the actions one of them is systems thinking and and you know uh, let me call out the four principles and then mm -hmm. maybe uh, uh, explain a little bit but the yeah. second one process and results the third one problems are opportunities or treasures and the fourth one non-judgmental or non-blaming uh, anyway the thing with systems thinking is uh, seeking to understand that yeah, you're not an isolated island. In what you do is affecting others, and others can affect what you do. And the thing is that more often than not, as an example, the point of detection of a problem is not necessarily where that uh, originated. So more than likely, you have to go upstream and understand uh, the point of cause or point of occurrence, as some people call it, uh, P-O-O -O or P-O-O, uh, <laughs> is so interesting. But the thing is that, again, you, more than likely, you're going to have to work with others. And that, that said, uh, when you have to work with others, then more than, more than likely, you have to engage the, the leaders uh, because, you know, again, usually you are divided in sections or departments and you have leaders. So... Uh, Again, you need to work with those leaders to be, uh, through the leaders to be able to solve the problem to root. System thinking is quite important. The second one is process and results related to, yes, results are so critical, right? Uh, on the direction of ideal or perfect, mm -hmm. you know, no harm, no defects, no complaints and so forth, no delays. Uh, and uh, we will like, you know, uh, customers are expecting, we as customers are expecting only the best, right? Uh, what we need, when we need it, and et cetera. Et cetera. So results are important. Mm -hmm. Yet the how we achieve the results or the process is also um, equally important. So versus maybe some people thinking, I don't care how you do it, just do it. Mm -hmm. So we care how you do it, but also we care about the outcomes. And the third one is quite important to establish, to your point, um, you know, um, professional and emotional safety. Here, an attitude maybe, the problems are treasures, uh, the problems are challenging. Our hypothesis is refuting, uh, it's telling us we don't know something, it's telling us we are ignorant <laughs> of something. Yet, again, this is an opportunity to to learn, and that's why problems are opportunities or treasures. Uh, again, we are about to acquire a knowledge. Uh, and with that, you know, as we consider problems as opportunities, then a very important one, which is non judgmental, non blaming, and this has to do with uh, establishing safety, professional, emotional. You know what? Do not blame the people, do not um, judge them, uh, blame the process. We believe that we have problems in our process but also in our systems. So that's what we need to understand. What are the root causes in the processes or the systems so we can uh, address that? You know, often, uh, you know, people could um, judge people directly, but also at times 
stating, oh, what we need is more training or more accountability. And right there, in reality, you are judging uh, the, the people rather than the process. So those guiding principles I was able to see. And, uh, and then, uh, I mean, people uh, performing or living those, those uh, principles. Um, and then later, um, trying to teach that or model that uh, throughout many, many uh, years as we were coaching people to transform. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those four principles, as is, is you lay them out, you know, I think very, very clearly um, seem like principles that would apply in healthcare. So maybe we can shift the discussion a little bit to work that you've um, done in healthcare. Um, yes. Thank you. Applying those principles. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. Thank you. You know, since I began my journey in healthcare um, in back in 2006, to be exact, uh, I had the opportunity to, um, you know, help um, some of our customers in Wisconsin, to be specific in Milwaukee and then in Appleton, Wisconsin. And since then, you know, as we were going through the back then event-based improvement, you know, selected uh, value streams, trying to help redesign those. Um, But as we were doing that, it was clear to me that we needed to talk about uh, principles, you know, what guiding principles. So um, since uh, week one, I guess, I began translating, you know, those uh, concepts into healthcare. And I realized on, on week one that, yep, (laughs) <laughs> These are the same principles, yet I was able to see that uh, people did not feel safe necessarily. People feel felt blame back then and judged. People did not consider problems are treasures. And people were focused maybe just in the results and not necessarily in the process. So that was so interesting to me uh, back in 2006. And uh, it's been my my, um, you know, uh, preference to keep talking about that, obviously, you know, with later with the introduction of formal Toyota way or formal Chingo principles. Yeah, you know, some of this language maybe has changed a little bit, but those four guiding principles are still guiding my coaching and my uh, and my work and that uh, I use again in this case to develop people to understand the why we are doing this how we are doing this and then you know it's easier to collaborate with people when people understand and live these guiding principles and so maybe you know can you elaborate a little bit more on the idea of developing people particularly in healthcare how can leaders go about that how do you go about that as an advisor to healthcare organizations and what does that lead to when you're developing people yeah Well, you know, the the develop people, in in this case, to be specific, um, to, uh, you know, see problems that prevent us from uh, performing to ideal, right? Um, And that's kind of like a a lesson learned from the Toyota approach, Uh, thinking uh, to begin with what's ideal. And uh, so, and right there, maybe... So, so with that, then, what is a problem? And uh, beginning with, to your point, you know, wait, a problem, it's anything but zero, as an example, zero risk or zero harm or zero delays or zero complaints, anything but zero, it's a problem, meaning a deviation from the expectation or a deviation from normality. That would be a problem. And, uh, but again, problem there uh, to challenge our hypothesis and, uh, and so teach people to to see problems, but also to welcome problems. That's a, a very important a point. And how by, uh, you know, when you people can see the problems and then they, they uh, need to understand that at times you need to break down the problem because sometimes, oh my goodness, you're trying to solve so many problems or complex problems that uh, people need to understand that, oh, I need to break it down and I, t- I need to take a bite and then go from there um, and um, develop uh, for them to understand that, um, that these uh, problems, again, in reality, 
have uh, this are symptoms, and these symptoms uh, we need to understand the uh, um, you know the, the the diagnosis, if you will. What are the root causes? So when we are developing people, we are developing people to see the problems in the process, and we are developing to for them to solve those problems using scientific method, a PDCA uh, method, using some rules of design, um, you know, things such as standard works or pool systems or visual management, things that can help people, again, um, improve flow, but also improve uh, performance right there. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the connection with developing people, building their capabilities. Um, interesting, um, you know, Toyota states uh, often um, something that I really like, which is, um, um, you know, uh, we we build uh, we build uh, people, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, and and then yes, we build cars. Um, when I got to work in healthcare. I think um, I have heard multiple times since week one, Jose, but we don't build widgets. <laughs> we don't build cars. Right. Patients are not cars. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I have heard that almost. It's true, <laughs> but. <laughs> it's true. Yet, yet, uh, you know, people, um, people in healthcare uh, perform activities or processes that um, are imperfect, that they with problems, and we people also create problems. So with that, how can we solve these problems so we can improve, in this case, the outcomes or the results for the customer, but also for our organization, right? How can we keep our people safe? How can we improve our you know, employee and customer satisfaction and so forth? So. And you, know, you you raise you know a good point about some of the problems that we face in healthcare being really big problems. And depending on how it's framed, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the idea of breaking a problem down. Because you know, executive team might look at harms. Well, even right there, that's both patient harms and employee harms. And what what can you can maybe talk through the thought process of you know how would you narrow that down to something that's more solvable or at least in the short term you're not you're not going to eliminate harms at the snap of a finger but how would you break that down to make it more solvable well uh, uh two approaches um i guess the first one is you know when when we are talking about employee or patient harm what we like to do is one problem flow uh one harm or one risk is one too many anyway mm -hmm. So what we want to do is take the freshest, the more fresh problem, and what we want to do is go after, initiate the incident investigation right away because we believe that uh, information is perishable. So right there, we want to go to where and when we believe uh, we have detected the problem and then right away uh, go upstream and uh, seek to understand the point of cause, and right there, we want to practice root cause analysis. And right there, maybe we will, we we might have more than one potential root cause. But with that, we want to uh, select a few of those and uh, and define a process change to rapidly, uh, you know, test through some experimentation, and uh, hopefully, we can solve the problem to root within a few hours. Um, otherwise, when we are talking about, you know, days or weeks, then more than likely we, ha we have lost perishable information. So one of the approaches there is that as we are trying to solve the problem in the first, uh, you know, few hours, you know, maybe 18 hours uh, or maybe 36 hours, if we realize that we have lost perishable information so we cannot learn any more one of the activities is there is to say, stop it. You need to drop it. You need to abandon so we can focus on the next, the freshest problem, because that's where we have the opportunity to learn. Again, one problem at a time, 
that uh, has created harm um, uh, or is a, is a risk that, uh, uh, you know, you could expect a correlation between that risk and then a, a, a potential uh, harm to employees. That's one way, Mark, to attack or to break. Um, and, and yet, when you are doing that, and you're able to solve some problems, but realizing that you will not be able to solve many problems. So right there, what you are doing is um, documenting these problems, collecting data, uh, and then later maybe analyzing and realizing that, uh, you know what, it looks like um, we, need, we need to address this big problem. Um, this is maybe a systemic problem. That's maybe when we have to do some pathway redesign or some people call it value stream redesign uh, that's again maybe a different type of um, uh, improvement type of activity yet that pathway usually or value stream usually you want to break it down into segments of the of the process uh, meaning you, you're not trying to solve the whole value stream or the whole process in one improvement activity usually you want to break it down into segments or bytes that, that people can connect cost and effect relationship you know uh, you know what let us experiment in this segment let us make some changes and for every change let us understand the the benefit or what are we what cost and effect learning do we have are we learning anything um, and and if yes great and if not then let's um, let's move on to the next experiment you know, that's one way, Mark, to go through, break it down. The other way is uh, at times, you know, people batch the improvement work and uh, they collect data and uh, then they maybe after a few weeks or months, they want to go through some analysis and some, uh, you know, decisions. and. Uh, you know, maybe in that moment, um, if you are doing that, which is maybe not the best approach, then, uh, you, you know, this big gap you want to, uh, in performance, as an example, rather than having zero harm, you have 10 um, injuries, then, okay, what is the breakdown of these 10 injuries? Because you can say, let us eliminate all harm. Yeah, yeah, but let's break it down. Let's go after one problem at a time can we take one of the 10 uh can we take uh, two of the 10 that are similar and try to address that problem in you know in the toyota business practices or the toyota way the documented problem solving process from toyota step one is what is the gap against the ideal the second one is so interesting break down this gap into into uh, smaller problems and mm -hmm. sometimes that's when we get into the tools such as the Pareto that we can use the first level the second level the third level Pareto that can help us pick one to break it down and pick one of those uh, smaller problems so we can go after that and 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 uh, hopefully address the root cause and then move on to the next uh, uh, smaller problem we we, we want to go after mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and thank you for that. And I, I, in particular, I really like the way you, you say, you know, information is perishable and that emphasizes the need to not wait for monthly reports on harms, but to see one, solve one, take yes. the lessons forward and, and prevent future harms. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Mark, you asked me earlier in this conversation about Jidoka mm -hmm. and that's in that's kind of the concept of Jidoka, right? Um, when people see a problem, you are demanded. <laughs> you want to be, you're demanded to call it out, to call it out. And if this is something that endangers uh, safety for employees or patients, uh, you know, uh, stop and uh, then try to isolate from risk and try to eliminate the problem now. And if you cannot then pull for your help chain to help you, um, again, do not manage the problem do not work around or ignore the problem but rather solve the problem or seek to solve the problem right now so you can learn about the root causes and then later eliminate that root cause uh, but but in real time in real time that's a 
that's kind of the judoka that I was able to see at uh, back then I'm at, at four people stopping the process and expectation that, oh my goodness, you know, like uh, thousands of times per day, people stopping the process, even you thinking, what the heck, you know, this process, these people do not know how to manage, um, you know, production or something like that. But in reality, no, 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 by design, we want to expose problems and we want people to uh, solve these problems. And that's part of, you know, how we develop our capabilities for the people and the processes, and then we can produce a better product also. So maybe um, final question, I mean, while we're, you've kind of got things back to Judoka. Um, yep, yep. I think sometimes, you know, people have a misunderstanding that, uh, you know, in a, in a Toyota plant or similar, when somebody pulls the and on cord that the line stops immediately. Now right. earlier you you talked about situations where okay well that that's not exactly how it right. works, but right. I was wondering if you could you know kind of bring it back to healthcare and, and and talk about situations where stopping the process right now immediately isn't possible or isn't wise. Do you, do you have an example or, or, or can you talk a little bit more about sure. swarming and and doing so as quickly as possible? How how you would find that balance in healthcare? Sure. You know, just a, maybe a, a couple of examples. One of them is, you know, uh, in uh, surgical services is a good example where uh, when you are prepping for a surgery, uh, there is a, a, a process that defines what, what is your need. And um, uh, long story short, it's clear uh, if, you know, a surgeon will perform a specific, uh, you know, a surgery on your left or your right uh, hand, as an example. So there's a process out there that is called a timeout that uh, people have to run that process just before surgery. And uh, right there, when people is going through that checklist, if if they see a problem or deviation or there is a doubt, <laughs> just a doubt, mm-hmm. then they it they are demanded to to time out and uh, and and say stop it we're going to cancel or delay this surgery because we're not going to risk the, the the patient so right there again that's a good example of they pulling the cord if you will they uh, being authorized and demanded to stop the process to prevent harm from happening um uh, another example is at, at times when uh, you know, um, a, a doctor is uh, maybe writing uh, a treatment order and uh, maybe it can be a medicine that uh, they are saying, I need, uh, you, you know, we need to prescribe this uh, specific treatment with this specific, uh, you know, uh, drugs. And uh, the point is sometimes, you know, you cannot read what, what they have uh, written out there. And the thing is that sometimes uh, what could happen is that somebody can uh, misinterpret that. And by doing that, people can uh, create uh, something that will be uh, administered to the patient. So one of the ideas there is that if the pharmacist or the uh, you know the nurse is able to see that there is uh, an error. Um, maybe in the you know what they sh- they are authorized to stop it and 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 say this is wrong mm-hmm. um, and, and I don't want to proceed because you the doctor wrote there 0.01 and you provided me 0.1. It's just an example on the doses, but the thing is that uh, you know again the. The it is safe for um, for in this case nurses or pharmacists to state and say no this is we're not going to proceed with the order from the doctor because it is wrong and because if we proceed that could cause some harm and by the way the doctor will not take that personally or felt that he was um, trash under the bus or something like that. But rather, no, no, this is the right thing to do. Uh, again, uh, there are many processes in healthcare that uh, are designed to fail today. 
but uh, the idea is how can we engage people to uh, redesign those processes in one side to prevent harm or uh, prevent risk or detect that and but then right there we need people to feel safe to stop the process when they see a problem when and where uh, is possible to your point sometimes you cannot stop in the middle of something sometimes you need right. to you need to complete to the to the next uh, stop if you will uh, sometimes that that's just a few steps uh, downstream or just a few seconds or a few minutes downstream um, rather than days or weeks so again when is safe to a stop I, I think that's that's kind of the the decision making point there that uh, when we are going to stop yeah well uh, Jose I really want to you know thank you for sharing you know some of your own personal journey and then you know especially the idea that lean and the Toyota production system is about principles that um, are very transferable maybe um, you know just as a, a, a final question here do you have any other, um, you know, kind of, it was a very open-ended question, sorry. Any other, sure. you know, advice or, or thought you would want to leave with the listeners? If you had a chance, let's say the proverbial elevator ride with a hospital executive, what what might you bring up in, in that short conversation? Well, you know, I believe that uh, transformations uh, should be uh, leader-led. Um, people expect... Um, uh, you know, to to do a good job. So, but uh, people need uh, leadership to demonstrate by by doing. People, you know, if if enough people care, uh, there's a movie out there. If enough people care, from Lou Holtz. But um, just thinking that the leaders by talking will uh, influence what people do is 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 a bad expectation. So. Rather, we want leaders uh, demonstrating or leading from the front. And for that, we expect leaders to uh, learn first. Otherwise, they cannot teach others. They cannot um, develop their people if they have not gone through this transformation themselves. So I think um, th that's something that uh, it applies to any industry. Um, you know, one of the differences, I guess, uh, in healthcare. Uh, of course, you are you are dealing with people lives, and but also you're dealing with uh, people feelings a lot. Um, you know, almost since uh, week one, uh, I was reminded that uh, this is not just technical, uh, Jose or tools. Um, you know, we we also care a lot about feelings and our passion. And mm -hmm. and anyway, I I am uh, reminded often that uh, you know you have to not just uh, see, but in reality is beyond. Uh, using that sense of uh, the observation, but also, I guess, sensing the the, the feelings is a very important, uh, you know, skill that um, I'm still working on trying to acquire and develop. <laughs> That's what I can tell. So. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that's something where we all continue developing and practicing and getting better here. But um, thank you for that thought. And maybe, well, at, at some point we, we could do a whole, uh, a whole additional episode about what a leader led transformation is all about. <laughs> so we'll do that sometime, Jose. Yes. Thank you so much, Mark, for uh, that invitation. I'll, I'll take it. Okay. So um, again, our guest today has been Jose Bastillo. He's a client advisor with Value Capture. If you want to learn more about Jose or connect with him, you can do so through the Value Capture website and the the, the, the team page, I mean, go to valuecapturellc.com. Jose, thanks again. Thank Always you so much, Mark. Thank you.